thank you all for coming. I know that uh, normally it would be rough for everyone to come because everyone's busy learning at night. But tonight, not allowed to learn. Uh, so, so a few guys were able to make it. So, <laughs> so, so um, let's start. So, so you know, it's not. I don't have every time. It's not. It's not usually usual that I have uh, half the crowd at least that, that know me. I know them before. It makes me a little more nervous. So let's see. I have to impress uh, Yitzi and a few other guys. Maish, uh, hard to impress, right? So. Uh, but um, Bezrat Hashem, we'll speak a little bit about Nittelnacht, about Christmas itself, about the relationship between Jews and Christians over the years. And if we have time, um, and we'll get into other interesting customs that we've uh, developed and have evolved over our long exile. And the reason for that is, because this is a, quite a knowledgeable fellow here to my left, is, is that I'm not here to give a halacha shir. Or about a minig share. I don't do halakha, I don't do minig, I don't do history. But where, with minig, especially later minhagim or quasi minhagim, like like Christ, uh, like, like not Christ, no, sorry, nitelnach. I'm sorry, I'm used to speaking about other topics. I apologize. But nitelnach is a product of the exile. It's a product of our relationship with Christianity and living in their proximity. So that means it's a historical. It's a historical story. It's how something develops over time in our communities, in our long story, and there are other customs like that also, so if we have time, we'll try to get to that also. I'll start off with a couple of stories that will kind of lead us in. First story is we're in Lithuania, in Lita, in Kovna, and it's during the war years. The Holocaust is taking place. The Holocaust of the Jews of Kovna is, you know, uh, Lithuania was part of the Soviet Union before the at the beginning of the war. So the policy that the Nazis uh, did to the Jews of Lithuania was within the framework of what they how they perpetrated the final solution to the Jews of the Soviet Union, which was by the means of mass executions and shootings into pits outside of the town. They didn't bring anyone to gas chambers. That was the policy in other parts of Europe, which is another story in itself about why they implemented different policies for different parts of the occupation. So the Jews of Kovna, the Jews of Kovna ghetto, in a series of aktsias, of actions, where they round up uh, Jews of the Kovna ghetto and take out several thousand. <coughs> sometimes it was children, sometimes people who couldn't work, and sometimes it was whoever they could get their hands on. They sent them out outside, mainly to a place called the Ninth Fort, which is on the outskirts of the city, Old Tsarist Fort. Now, in this ninth fort, they buried them originally in mass graves. In 1943, after Stalingrad, the Nazis realized they're losing the war. They need to take care of all the evidence. So they have, they, they, uh, they have again, what's called Aktion 1005. That just happens to be the name of it. Where they have a group of slave labor Jews who have one of the worst tasks in human history. They have to dig up these graves, these uh, bodies, excuse me, these corpses and burn them, destroy the evidence. And they are the permanent labor, they're all over the Soviet Union, but the group who was stationed at the Ninth Fort, they're permanent labor. So this is, place is an extermination site, but there's also a forced labor brigade there. And they essentially are witnesses to the mass murder, and they have to do horrible work, and they decide they're going to try to escape. How could they escape? So it's a whole story of how they managed to escape. And, and it was a long planning, and when the main Jew who organized it was a military experience. His name was Kolya Vasilenko, and he organized the brigade into what the hell they should do it and break through this wall and cut it, and they cut it with like spoons so over time during the shift when the Nazis were bit weren't there. And a whole process of how they did it. And they're ready to make their break. 64 prisoners. When are they going to make their break? When it's most likely to succeed, when there's fewer guards around, when the few guards who are around are drunk and they won't notice, they do it on Christmas Eve, tonight. That's the time that, it's, that they're able to do it. There's much less staff around from the Nazis, from the local Lithuanians, and whoever is, is partying, is drunk, and they make their break, 64 prisoners, and they make it out. They are the witnesses to what took place in the Ninth Fort, and we have the story of the 
decimation of the Jews of Kovna through this escape, and the escape itself is a wild story, but it happened on Christmas Eve. This Kolya Vasilenko, he later said, I don't know if Jesus was born on December 25th, but we were born again on December 25th. That night, we, were, we got a second chance at life. We were doomed, we were victims, we had given up, and we were born again. That's number one. And I'll get back and I'll try to bring everything together. The second story is that, and I was in, in, uh, <coughs> in Bar Park today visiting some relatives, so I, you know, I made a deal. My wife, we have to visit your relatives and we have to visit some historical landmarks in Bar Park, so we stopped at Mir Minion also, 50, uh, 54th Street and 60th Avenue. And we, uh, we went into Mir Minion, which was founded by a group of Mir survivors, uh, Mir Shanghai, not survivors, <coughs> refugees, who they settled down in Borough Park, they had lost all their families, and they built a shul of Mir alumni. Today there's not really anything left of it, so it's only a historical landmark, but it once was a very happening place, a fraternity of sorts, of, of, of Mir who had gone through the war, and all they had were each other. And, and uh, one of the, in, inside the shul there, they have on the Pereiches, uh, that it's donated Lili Nishmas, Reb Moshe Leib Levavitz, Ben Hagayin, Reb Yeruchim Levavitz, the Mashgiach of the Mir. Moshe Leib Levavitz was the son of the Mashgiach. His son is a Rebbe in the Mir today, Reb Nachman Levavitz, and he was a Sheichet. And he was actually a clean-shaven Sheichet, like a real Litvak. And uh, Reb Shraga Feivel Mendelavitz once checked his challah for someone to see if he's a good Sheichet. And he said, yeah, he's good, he's son, he's, he knows Hilchah Shechita also, and he's a good shaykh, and Rabbi Shraga Feivel's son, it was the 1940s, he had a young son, he, I don't know if it was Rabbi Yankel Shef or Rabbi Shia Shef, and he asked, um, I'm sorry, that's son-in-law, Shia Shef, uh, one of his sons, either way, it doesn't matter, he, um, he asked him, are we going to eat from it, and they're Hungarian, so Rabbi Shraga Feivel says, if he grew a beard, we'll eat from his Shechita, so Rabbi Shalei Levav said to him, my father taught me that you shecht with a chalof, not with a beard. Okay. So he was a Shaykhid. And a Shaykhid had to be out in Pennsylvania. He, his kids were in Borough Park. His wife lived in Borough Park. But he was out in Pennsylvania, in Iowa, and different places where he lived all week. And he would come back. He would come back once during the week. He would come back for Shabbos, for the weekends. He wasn't around during the formative years when his kids were growing up. But there was one week and a half of the year that he was around. That was the week of... Christmas to New Year's. He was able to be around, and he would go with his kids to shul. And he would learn with them at night. And he said, that he looked forward to it all year. He was, it was, this was great. This was his being a father. This was getting to learn with his kids. And he told his kids, he said, if back in the mirror, when I was growing up in the mirror, when I lived with my father as the mashkiach of the mirror, when it was, if you would have told me that there's going to come a day that you're going to look forward to Christmas all year round? I would have thought you're crazy. <laughs> look forward to Christmas? What, what does that have to do with my life? I live such a spiritual, holy, Jewish... The Mir was like over 90% Jewish. The, the Poles lived on the outskirts of the town, in like farming settlements. The town was a Jewish town. And here, he looks forward to it all year round, because that's when he has off, and that's when he's able to learn with his kids. So that's another, another aspect. Then we go ahead... Another few years, and when I was a bacher by Rav Asher Arieli Shir, which I'm assuming some of you, I think Mesh was there, um, a couple of you guys probably were. So Rav is the only shir in the mirror that has shir in the afternoon. The, in the winter, the afternoons is already after shkia. So what happens in the, every other shir is in the morning. There's no problem. They don't run into nitelnach problems. Rav Asher shir is in the afternoon. It's, after, it's already dark outside. It's 6 o'clock. Nittelnacht comes, both Nittelnachts, right? We'll mention it, but the, the two different calendars, the Julian calendar and the Gregorian calendar, so there's two Nittelnachts, and some Hasidim hold one, some Hasidim hold the other, the Machmirim hold both. You know, and some are to make a day, so they have second day Yantiv, so they have, you know, so there could be a bunch of days where you have Nittelnacht, and they, and they, and Shir in those days, and Rosh Hashir has a lot of Hasidim, about half. So you're talking about all of a sudden you have a shear where half the guys aren't there. And it was like kind of weird. You know what I mean? Like it's a regular shear. It's a regular night. Or a usher comes and gives a shear. And here half the shear just doesn't show up. 
And it also upset him. I mean, he said, you're coming to a shir, you're coming to a yeshiva, you gotta like, accustom yourself to the surroundings, and we're giving shir, we're continuing with the program, and this is part of the curriculum, so... But no, we're very mock, but we don't learn it until now, so we're not showing up to Rav shir also. <coughs> so here we have three different angles on the Jewish relationship, in recent, all recent history, to the idea that Christmas is a day on the calendar. Now, if you ask anyone, do they celebrate Christmas? Celebrate Christmas? I'm Jewish. Even if a person is not such a religious Jew, if he's a traditional Jew, he doesn't celebrate Christmas. Christmas is a Christian holiday. It's not like Thanksgiving. It's not like uh, Martin Luther King Day. It's not a national holiday. It's a religious holiday. We don't celebrate it. And yet, it's there. And we deal with it. And it exists throughout history in many forms, in many facets, in many fashions. And, 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 and it's something that has presented itself as a challenge to history, not only in its external manifestation of being a holiday and a date on the calendar, but it really is a symbolism of something much greater than that, of the relationship between the two peoples and how they interact. So we'll talk a little bit about... Um, Nittelnacht, and, and that, uh, with in mind, these three anecdotes uh, that I mentioned. So, the, the, um, the reality of, of Nittelnacht, and, uh, oh. so, uh, so the, the reality, Nittelnacht uh, existed, um, sorry, let's turn that off. Uh, the Nitzunach existed for a long time. It's not a new invention, and it was not invented by Hasidim. Um, in other words, um, today it's come to be uh, very much attached that the Hasidim don't learn Nitzunach. So if we would say that it's a Hasidic minig, and, and they're the ones who do it, that means that the earliest that we would find any sources for Nitzunach would be in the 18th century, because before that there weren't any Hasidim. And yet, lo and behold, there seems to be uh, earlier sources for Nitzanach that people don't learn or people commemorate it in some way, shape, or form in all different uh, ways. Excuse me. And uh, it predates Hasidim. So essentially what we're seeing is that the Hasidim kept that minig where other parts of the Jewish people have neglected it or neglected or moved on from it. We'll see soon why some people stopped keeping it and what the different reasons are. But Hasidim have kept it. By the way, if, if we're mentioning Nitzanach as something that the Hasidim kept, well, it used to be a universal custom that everyone kept, so that happens to be true about a lot of Minhagen. Um, is mitzvah tans a Hasidic custom? Or what is, what is I mean, Nobody tried to convince me that everyone does mitzvah tans today, but in Eretz Yisrael, only Hasidim do mitzvah tans. <laughs> um, but it's, so it's, it's a seemingly, a, again, a minic custom that Hasidim do, and people who are not Hasidim don't do. It happens to come from a much earlier source. There's a professor in, uh, I forget where he teaches, in Eretz Yisrael, Dr. Maoz Kahana, who wrote half a book on the topic of how, how the legacy of the old Ashkenaz, the old Germany, the old, from the time of the Maril and the early Ashkenaz Rishonim, and the, those communities, the German and French communities, how a lot of their customs were either kept by Hasidim, traveling through Hungary, the Hasam Seifer, that route made it to Hasidim, and they sometimes are the only ones who keep it because of the migration of the Jewish people to other lands, and he explains it and elaborates it. But it's an interesting topic how, you know, the Hasidim would start off as a new movement. They, in the end, during the, over the course of the 19th century, they end up being the ones who turn ultra-conservative, and they're the ones who are latching on and not giving up on any custom, on any, anything, when they had originally, in the 18th century, been the innovators. In the 19th century, they turn into the uh, opposite of innovators. They want, to keep, uh, they want to keep everything as was. So that's also uh, a different topic. However, <coughs> the idea of Nittelnacht exists. But what we're, we're talking about is the specific custom of not learning on Nittelnacht. There's a lot of things that people don't do on Nittelnacht. The, the Hassam Seifer writes how it's terrible that they closed the mikvahs on the Tanakh. I mean, 
it means that that was a custom that people did. Doctors were closed on it till now. We don't do that. There's also something. What's that? Oh, men didn't really use the mikvahs in like some surface area, but uh, but they didn't use them at night either. That's true. Oh, nacht means night. Taka. Um, the uh, so there's all, all sorts of uh, things that are not done on Nitlanach, but the most commonly known and accepted one is not to learn. It's also the easiest to do, you know. Like it's Tisha above everyone's major depressed also because we can't learn. So Nitlanach is not. By the way, one of the reasons given for not learning Nitlanach is Avelis, like Tisha above, is because. The Jewish people is mourning because of what happened on Christmas. Uh, Jesus was born, by the way, it's not really clear that he was born, and it comes really from a pagan holiday. That, that, was, a, that was a holiday that was kept by many pagan tribes from before, and it has some funny Latin name that I don't remember and probably can't pronounce correctly. Anyway, with, what's that? Saturnalia. Amazing. And, oh, ancient history, right. So there you go. So it's related to winter solstice, and it's related to the winter solstice, and and which is which all the pagan all the pagan religions did 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 their uh, you know based their calendar on what was happening in the in the cosmos and the in the upper realms of the atmosphere, and that they attached significant importance to weather changes, seasonal changes. All pagan religions did that, so it makes sense. The kufus, we have the kufus, yeah. the water, we still yeah. Summer, yeah, yeah. But um, but the the so so but assuming he was born again, that's what we also start off the Kol Yevaselenko. He said, I don't know if Jesus was born that day, but we were reborn again. So let's assume that he was. So it's a time for mourning because look what destruction it did. This person tried to destroy Yiddishkeit, and then all the tortures and the terrible things that happened to the Jewish people because of that throughout history, and therefore it's a time for mourning. And if it's a time for mourning, so it's Avelus, so there's Dine Avelus. So you know how to learn Tyra. Why don't we keep any other Dine Avelus? Because maybe we should all wear slippers tonight, or not, we'll not take a shower. I don't know, this one kind of stuck. But that's, that's just one reason for it, right? So the idea of not learning, um, many people have discussed really. Earlier Sfarim, um, and throughout, throughout history, it has been raised and emphasize that this is the principal reason for the not learning Torah on Crystal Nach. Excuse me? Why, why I, was, I was really, what? Why would it only be night? If it's not available, it should be the whole day. It should be the whole day. That's also a point. If it's because of Avelis, it's because of the whole day. If, if, and it's a good point. Yeah. Now, if we go with some of the other reasons, which we'll get to in a second, then it makes a lot of sense why it's only at night. Avelis is a problematic reason. It, it, there's, there's some issues with it, and you mentioned one of them. So Nittal is, 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 uh, is, 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 um, is not, to, not to learn Tyra that night. And, um, <coughs> and the main reason, from the beginning, and it's brought again and again and again and again, um, re most recently, in recent years, again recently meaning the last 40, 50 years, of Yanki Kamenetsky, he... Uh, it was a real litvax you know, to, <laughs> to, to make it a very like cult uh, technical reason for it. But it was a technical, very simple reason. And this really brings us into the historical side of it. On Christian holidays in medieval Europe, in the Middle Ages, and especially a significant holiday, more than just Good Friday or the beginning of Lent or, or something like that, but a real significant holiday such as Christmas, kicks off the today it's today we live in a world where where Christianity or religion in general is not and not a major component of identity perhaps of individuals it still is at some level in parts of the world definitely not on a national level and the power of the church is almost non-existent we have to get back get, you know and also today holidays are completely commercialized they're not they're not uh, of uh, really any religious significance. It's more, it's very, very commercial, especially in the Western countries. But if we go back into the mindset of the Middle Ages, we have to understand the dominance of religion. Religion was everything. The power of the Catholic Church was almost unlimited at the time. They controlled princes and kings and emperors. And the Catholic religion was the only identity that people had. It wasn't just something else that exists. They didn't also just go to church on Sunday. 
the, 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 the religion was everything. And in that context, religious holidays were dangerous times for the Jewish people. And this comes up in many, in many ways. Um, and uh, the, the most dangerous day of the week was Sunday. The most dangerous times of the year were the Jewish holidays. Uh, excuse me, the Christian holidays. To an extent, the Jewish holidays also, especially when sometimes they overlapped with Christian holidays, such as Pesach and Easter. One of the reasons that the blood libel was so successful is because it was right around when they were getting riled up about Easter. So, and Pesach was all usually right around that time. So the, the, the libel against the Jews expressed itself in a Pesach form um, because Christian holidays were dangerous times that they were filled with religious fervor, sometimes riled up by parish priests, not even by the Pope or by the government or by the bishops, or very often at the ground, grassroots level by simple parish priests who very often not very intelligent themselves, but they explain to their congregants and uh, that, that the Jews really did kill Jesus, and they're guilty, and they're damned, and whatever it is. And they have to, and they, they're, they're, you know, they turn into a mob, and very often pogroms, libels, things happen. And this was not a time to be excited for. So they always prepared themselves before these major holidays, and they tried to do everything they could to avoid trouble. And so the Jewish communities, it was a me mechanism of survival in Europe during that time. Another point, another demographic point. Today we live in a very heterogeneous society, especially here in New York, but even in Europe, in most parts of Europe. Very, a lot of people from different ethnic backgrounds, national backgrounds, religious backgrounds, all types, all colors. In Catholic Europe of the Middle Ages, there is basically two types of people. An overwhelming majority of Catholics, and a small minority of Jews. That's it. This is before the Protestant Reformation. There is no Muslims in most of Europe, a little bit on the Iberian Peninsula, Peninsula a little <coughs> bit in the Balkans. That's it. The rest is Catholic. There's nothing else in Europe. And the minority is the Jews. And that creates a very interesting relationship also. They're the exclusive minority. And any time minority issues come, or minority prejudices or discrimination rises, it's against the only existing minority. So, so a time like Christmas is dangerous. And Jews don't want to be out in the streets. And there we go back to what you said. When is it dangerous to be out in the streets? Mainly at night, during the day. Today everyone has off uh, during the day. In those days you couldn't really take off. It wasn't like a vacation, you know. People had to work and, uh, and there was normal life during the day. It was light outside. There was protection of the law to a certain extent. People were going about their daily business, even on holidays, to a certain extent. And therefore, during the day, for many reasons, is less dangerous. But what it was dangerous to go was out at night. So people did not go out, out at night. Now, community leaders, rabbis, other community leaders, would warn the people, the common people, do not go out at night. It's dangerous. Now, again, let's go back to the Middle Ages, before the printing press. Did people have big farm shrunks? Today we're going back to that. Today, because we have Eitzra Chachma today, and, and, and all types of things. People don't have it. <coughs> Until 15 years ago, it was very common for every private home to have hundreds of Sfarim. Every type of Sefer exists. Anytime you need to learn, or even if you don't need to learn, we just want to impress people that come into your house and say, hey, look, I, I'm a learned and knowledgeable fellow. I have all these Sfarim in my house. That was, that's a normal part of our, our culture. In the manuscript culture, people did not have svarim in their homes. Svarim were almost non-existent. And people didn't know things by heart. They were simple people. I don't know what the stories are, that they all knew everything by heart and whatever. It's not true. <laughs> they were very simple people. If they wanted to learn, there was one way to go and learn. You went to the local shul, the local base measures, local base knesses of the kahal, of the community, and either a rabbi or some other learned and knowledgeable fellow gave a shear, which people listened to, or you took a manuscript off the shelf and you studied yourself or with a friend. That was the only way to do it. So going to shul equals learning, staying at home equals not learning. What did they do instead? Probably went to sleep. There wasn't much else to do of forms of entertainment in the 13th and 14th centuries. But uh, that's all they did. 
So now, when you want to warn people to stay at home, what are you telling them to do? To not learn. Because they can't. Right? And it just becomes a reality of, of what's happening. And that kind of develops into a system that we don't learn. In other words, this, this school of thought believes that there was no esoteric and mystical reason for Nitlanach, and it's not because of Avelos for sure, but it's not even because of the Klippus, and it's not even because of his Neshama, and it's not because of Tayr Lishma, and all the other reasons that are given, which are more either Talmudic or mystical. But it's a very simple base reason that you're telling the people to stay at home. Stay at home means don't learn. And that goes up not only to medieval times, it goes up to modern times also. Because even after the advent of the printing press, where it was a little bit more accessible to have farm. But until the 1800s, you know, Shimon Shkaps Yeshiva, which was not that long ago, it was, uh, you know, a um, hundred something years ago. Last time I spoke about Rosh Shimon Shkaps and his Yeshiva, so every Sharatayr alumnus woke up and they started sending me emails and correcting me. And okay, so I, you know, I try to be careful now, I don't want to get anyone angry. I gave one a Chaim Berlin or a Hutner recently and no one bothered me like that. <laughs> I always thought the Chaim Berliners are uptight about their legacy. Turns out Sharatayr has, uh, I don't know. They got very defensive. So I'm not going to say that much about Rav Shemishka. But he, in his yeshiva, in his yeshiva, for a period of time after World War I, they didn't have a full shas. They didn't have a full shas. I was just at a family uh, Hanukkah party, where I came from, and one of, the, one of the little kids running around, his name was Zev. I said, oh, you're named after your great-grandfather? On the other side, he's not related to me. I just uh, studied right here to him. Rabbi Wine's father, Rabbi Wine's father, his name was Zev Wine, but he was called, when he was in Grodna by Rav Shimon, he was called Velvel Chulin. Why? Because during that period of time that they didn't have a full shas, Rav Shimon took the top guys in the yeshiva, he had them memorize, he borrowed gemaras from people, and he had them memorize certain mesechtas and shas, that, uh, memorize it literally word for word, um, and, and the whole thing, it could be Rashi and Taisus also, I don't remember what the exact specifications were. And then you had a full shas in the yeshiva, and you wanted to look up a certain Gemara in Chul, and then you went to Velvel Chul, and you asked him, what does it say? And this and this, and he rattled it off to you. Now, I knew this guy, okay? I knew Velvel Chul, he lived till he was over 100 years old, and so I was able to get to know him a little bit. And, and, uh, and it's, it's real, it's a true story, you know, it's not made up. He was really a guy who, who knew Chulin, who knew Chulin like that. Now why was that important? Why was that necessary? Because there were not a lot of swarm and there were not a lot of... So again, so it's right up to modern times. The idea that I stay at home means you're not learning. And, and if I want to get them to be safe from pogroms, from people being beat up in the streets, from literally sometimes danger to human life, I have to, the rabbi of the community is responsible to make sure that everyone stays at home. That no one go out. No shiurim tonight. The rabbi is not giving a shir. No one else is giving a shir. Everyone stay at home. So according to that line of reasoning, so we didn't really accomplish anything by coming together tonight to not learn, right? Because we all came out of our homes. But it's not so dangerous anymore. And because of that, that line of reasoning says that it's not applicable today. Today, the Christians are not uh, making programs anymore against people during, their religion time, during the time of their religious holidays, and therefore it's unnecessary to keep the custom. But there's a lot of, by the way, there's a lot of customs like that that we do keep, meaning a lot of the development of Jewish customs is because of original reasons that created a, a you created the custom to be necessary. We still read Haftar every Shabbos. Most people don't know that because it's Kiddush Club at that time. You know, something goes on there, the rabbi's speech, there's something. Eretz Yisrael, if you go to one of these real ungazettes, the Litvisha Shuls, then they actually read it from a cloth, and they, they get all into it, so then you hear a little bit more about the Haftarah. And uh, recently a friend of mine was trying to convince me to go to Uman for Rosh Hashanah. So I, I, go, I told him, look, I've been to Uman more recently than you have. I bring groups there a bunch of times during the year. Rosh Hashanah crowds and you know I, I just can't handle it and so he says you should know there's every type there there's even yeshivish guys who come and bring a cloth with them so that they read the haftar from a cloth I was like wow that's, that's impressive we already have guys reading from a cloth and oh, come on for the haftar 
on Rosh Hashanah, then we're at, a, we're at a new level. Okay, so by the way, the custom of reading a cloth is also one of those new customs, maybe we'll get to that too. And, and but the idea, where does Haftar come from? Because the Roman Empire, they made a decree at one point that they're not allowed to read publicly from the Torah. So instead they read publicly from the Navi. The Roman Empire doesn't exist anymore. Even, I mean, right? Ancient history, it doesn't exist anymore. And, they, and, and, there's, no, and there's, no, there's no one forbidding anyone to read publicly from the Torah. Why are we still reading the Hav Torah? What's, what's, so some will say because that's the only opportunity we'll ever have to hear anything from Navi, because we'll never ever open a Navi otherwise. But that's not enough of a reason to do it. And because this was a minig, they keep the minig, and not only that, but keeping the minig reminds us where we once were, and it makes us appreciate who we are today. In other words, these minhagim can actually be historical reminders. The same way, I mean, the same way when we go on the trips to Europe, what are we trying to do? Right? You know, we're, we're trying to give a, give a sense of identity by showing where we once were, so we know where we are today, so that we can get an idea of where we're going. So a lot of these old customs, even though it's Batla Hasiba, the original reason doesn't make sense anymore. The Christians are not killing us if we walk out in the streets on Christmas Eve. So there's no reason, according to this school of thought, that we shouldn't be learning anymore on, on, uh, on, on Nittelmach. Yet, despite that, we keep the custom because of what once was. And therefore, um, um, there's, no, uh, there's no learning. Now, uh, as I said, there's other reasons that are proposed which I'm not going to get into. They have less to do with history and more to do with the Torah of Nittelnach because it gives strength to the Klippus, or, or excuse me, where, where Jesus came from. He obviously came from a Klipp, but he couldn't have come from a regular Nitzitzis uh, uh, of Kedusha. And there's other reasons that he learned Torah Shaloy Lishma. So we don't want to give him any source of Torah on that night. And there's other reasons like that. Is there proof to the theory, or it just makes... I hear the logic. But there's the lot, loads of proof, meaning there's a lot of circumstantial evidence by having pogroms Christmas Eve and people being warned not to go out that night. And again, going out at night, not going out at night means no learning. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's a given. Is that the only reason? Again, it's something that develops over time, over a wide geographical dispersion of communities over hundreds of years, there's going to be a combination of factors that come, come into play. It's, it happens all the time, and it's very hard to pinpoint to one thing and say, that's it, and everything else is wrong. Meaning, it's is usually, any, like, can you fop track that pogrom is therefore nithil not spreads to an area, or is there no such progression? The direct cause and effect would be hard to establish, but we do see, we do see the, the writings against uh, against going out at night in order to keep people safe, and uh, and therefore not to have any any chiurim, any any anything. Any they don't do it in Morocco or Iraq. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that's what I'm gonna get, get to. It. Right. It's like if Italy didn't have places that, that Poland, that's what I was about to get to. But these, but these uh, Christmas night uh, pogroms did come in some cases sometimes straight from the Pope, so it would be a mass you know mass uh, adoption of Jews if it came straight from the Pope. There were times yes. Pope Gregory yes. had mass, right? And, and, and yes. The, the Crusades were started because of <coughs> the first and second, at least, uh, but uh, uh, the, were started because the Pope went ahead and made a call to, to liberate the Holy Land from the infidels, and on the way they decided to take care of the local infidels. But, of course, it very often came from up top. How about taking on Christmas Eve, it came from yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very. It's it, there was all. I mean, we, did, we this again. Uh, <coughs> what I was trying to say in the beginning about it being so much part of our lives. We lived in Christian lands for a thousand years. That's a long time. It's a long time. I mentioned also the trips. We go on these trips, and there are big churches in in, in the United States, and you see them all over. And I mean, you have them downtown Manhattan. You have a very big and famous church, and they're really all over the place. But some of these European cathedrals are really impressive, and they're very dominant. And you walk, I was in Austria two weeks ago with a group, and we were walking, and we walked from the Stad Temple, a shul, and we're in the shul, and it looks pretty impressive, it's a beautiful shul. 
and we went on a walking tour of the center of town. It was two weeks ago, so everything was already decked out in, in the holiday uh, the holiday lights. And you come to the, I don't remember the name of the St. Stephen's Cathedral, I think, in the center of Vienna, and you're just like overwhelmed by it. You feel small and insignificant, and and this is, it's massive. It's it's. And it's, and it's not just huge, it's like intricate, the architecture and the design, and it's so dominant. And that, I thought, was like, I even stopped in front of it and talked to the guys a little bit about it. This, this feature of, 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 uh, of, of European Jewish life is something that is very often overlooked, about the dominant force of the church in the daily lives of the Jews, just because it's there, it's so present. And... You know, you ever go into one of these old shuls in here, and we go all the time, and every shul you go in, most shuls you go in, there's steps going down inside. Why is there steps going down inside? Let's see, who knows the right you reason? Who knows the right reason? Fortified. There is a reason. I can't say it's a wrong reason. Like I said, it's a combination of facts. Yeah, they weren't allowed to have the church. They weren't allowed to have it higher than the church. Not only were they not allowed to have higher than the church, but very often it wasn't just a technical thing of being two inches Lower, it was that it should look lower, and it should not be above a certain height, irrespective of whether you could even see the church nearby, because the Jewish place of worship should not be a dominant force on the landscape. It should not be something on the city landscape that's noticeable. The Jews aren't stupid, so they came up with this idea to dig it down, which is legal, to dig down underneath, and then inside the shul, it's tall, it's impressive, it looks great, and, uh, and we got out of that, the church thing, but outside it looks kind of small, it looks kind of short, it's not so impressive outside. Now, Jews throughout the ages, anything that they're forced to do, it's not, it's not so exciting to admit. Sometimes it's the omit with a few steps down. Oh, so, no, so when it was just like a little indent by the omit, then it's for sure because of the idea of you know, the Yom Hashem, right? But I'm saying that even when they did it because of the church, you're going to go ahead and tell your grandkids and tell, tell posterity, you know, we, we were really had rough times with the church and, and, and we were forced to do it this way. And Nebuch, that's what it means to be a Yid in Gullus in Europe during that time. You, you develop a, a religious justification for it. A, to make the Bidiyev and the Lachachil, which happens in every stage of our history, people eat Shirayim from a Tish till today. Why? Because the Rebbe eating, the Tzaddik eating, is a, is a Mizbeach. And his eating, excuse me, is like a Kayin eating from the Karban. Because the Tzaddik has purified himself and made himself a Kli for Avod Hashem. And everything he does is purely for Avod Hashem. And he's reached a certain Madrega in his Avod Hashem and his Kedusha and everything about him that his entire essence is Avod Hashem. Even the mundane, even the, the physical. Uh, part of his existence. And there, if you connect to the tzaddik, and the whole idea of a chassid is to try to connect to the tzaddik and gain from him and come close <coughs> to him, the hiskashras to the tzaddik, you partake in his meal. And there's a whole tire of chassidists to explain it, and I only touched, uh, touched on it a little bit. Is that why it started? Is that why it started? Because at some point in chassidists, they developed an idea that this is what a tzaddik is? No. The reason it started is because chassidim who came for two weeks in the mud and the snow of the Ukraine to be able to be by the Rebbe, leaving their family behind, leaving work behind, they usually didn't come with a full wallet into town. And they came in on Thursday night and Friday afternoon. They, have, they don't have a penny. They have no way to make Shabbos. And they came to hear Tyre from the Rebbe, to hear, to become better people, to, to grow in their spiritual life, to become better Jews, to grow in their way to Hashem. That's why they came. They didn't come to eat. Well, the Rebbe is a nice guy. He's, he's a tzaddik, right? Because he, he cares. He's a father to his chassidim. He's going to share his meal with them. He's going to give his own food and share it with his chassidim. That's, that's getting Shirai from the Rebbe. Now, again, so that's, that's how it starts. Now, once it started, once that's happening anyway, and by the way, that's one of the central ideas and themes of Hasid, is to take something that's mundane and technical and bring it and lift it up and give it Kedusha and give it meaning and give it essence and give it, and give it much more. So they make a whole Torah out of it. And then that Torah becomes very real. And that becomes very much part of the Hasidic experience and it's a custom that remains till today. So it's the same thing with Timah Makim, Krasih HaShem. 
that, that we go down to the depths, and that's why we do it, and that's why there's steps also, but it really very often begins because the church, the Christian authorities in the church, do not allow the shul to be, uh, to be uh, lifted up. So that's... Um, <coughs> Uh, running out of time here. So, the, um, try to, uh, to shorten it up. Um, I want to give a little uh, Q&A at the end also, if we have time. So now we, we got to the point where we're not learning. Okay, we're not learning, so what do we do instead? So this is where the, all the things get exciting, this is the part that everyone knows, right? That, um, that this Rebbe used to play chess, and, and why would they play chess, by the way? In Chabad, they're into playing chess. Square, they played chess. They, they, different tzaddikim played chess. What was the thing about playing chess? It accomplished a couple of things. First of all, even when they're not learning Tyra, but they, use, they do something that's good for the mind, that you... That you need a that you need a that you need to use your brain for not something mindless or soulless or brainless, something that that requires chachma that requires wisdom, and also to show the appreciation that the Jewish people have for games for chachma for the wisdom that's outside of the realm of Torah, and that was something that was done in certain areas uh, of playing chess. The chidush Arim of Ger would cut his toilet paper for the year. Now, today we have perforated uh, toilet paper. It's easier to cut. Yeah, Shabbos, 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 Shabbos. For the Shabbos, that's what I'm saying. For Shabbos. What? He would t- cut regular paper into toilet paper for Shabbos. Because you couldn't cut it on Shabbos. You need to cut it uh, for, for the... For, see, he would cut his... his yeah, see, he would normally would have a Shabbos grid. He wanted the Dafka to do it on, on Christmas Eve, which is, which is another... Which is another significant uh, uh, um, idea here. Why? First of all, where does the name Nittel come from? So it probably comes from a Latin word again, which I forgot exactly. Natal, Natal, Natal. Natal. What? Natal, like prenatal. Natal. Okay, that that was the uh, that was the original name of Christmas in Christian times. But there are those who wanted to say that it comes from the word Nitle, the hunged one, one who was hanged crucified by the Romans. By the way, crucifixion was just a form of execution that the Roman Empire did and used. It wasn't that Jesus was crucified because of a special crime that he did, but the way that people were killed when they received capital punishment in the Roman Empire was by crucifixion. A recent, a few years ago, I read an article about it. Not that I'm into archaeology. I, I mean, I, history is nerdy enough, but to go into archaeology, that have a little bit of self-respect. So the, the, uh, the, the, there was recent, I happened to read this article, and there, they, uh, some archaeologists in Israel found a ankle bone of a human, a human being with a rusty nail through it. The first physical evidence in history of actual crucifixion, which in the archaeology, Roman Empire history uh, world was like a fascinating discovery because we have Loads of documents attesting to it, but here was actual physical uh, um, uh, uh, documented evidence that, that it existed. So he's the hung one, and, and, and it's like a disgrace to him that he was hanged. Now there's a Gemara in Gittin that says that, that, that and today, the, uh, the, many of the new shasas that have been printed in recent years have brought back all the censored out Gemaras. By the way... One of the reasons why there's so much speculation about Christ, uh, about, I can't believe I'm saying it, about Nitalach, is I, mean, I brought here different theories, different schools of thought. What do the sources say? And the dearth of thor- sources is because of the censorship of the church. Most of the sources were, are gone. People were afraid to write them in the first place, and even when they did write them, they were very often censored out. Again, it reflects the reality of the time. It reflects the history of how these things developed. Anything that's going to be about Nittal Nach is going to be very sensitive to the church and to the church authorities. That the Jews are so upset that he was born and, and they're scared of the pogroms because of the horrible Christian. All, any reason that, it was, that it's around. And therefore there's very few sources on it. And it's only now that we're able to find more written about it because now there is no censorship and there's more freedom of what to write. 
And even though you just mentioned before that they still get in trouble if you write the, the full truth for the outside world, but uh, that exists uh, by us too. So um, there's also internal censorship. But in any event, the um, the 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 uh, so there aren't many sources about it. There's not not much be, have been able to written in the first place. So so the was I getting to? I got. Uh, Oh, so the, the, the Gemara and Gittin, which originally was censored out, who it was, it says Pesha Yisrael, but the new Gemara's are brought, who are we actually talking about? We're talking about Jesus. And the Pesha Yisrael, the Gemara says that he, his punishment in Gehenna is She Nidayim B'Tsayar Oisachas. So the Chizish when he's cutting the toilet paper on Itulnach, so some of the Hasidim said it's that he could easily ask the Shamish to do it, but he's doing it to show what this night is all about. It's about the toilet paper. So that has that angle to it also. Apparently his great his great his great grandson, the Imrayamas, the great Gerreba, he wasn't into the whole toilet paper thing and he decided instead to spend Nitlnach learning Polish. Uh, there was the debate in those days was should we learn the language of the country or stick to Yiddish? By the time the Imrayamas came around, especially people like him who were very cognizant of, uh, of what was going on in the outside world and how important it was to learn the local language, so there was a need to learn the local language and you couldn't just uh, do it with Yiddish. When are you going to learn it? So maybe the next generation they can learn it from a younger age. But someone like the Imrayamas. He's already an old big rebbe. He's going to start taking Polish lessons. He's going to take a course at Warsaw University. What's he going to do? So he spent little nacht every year improving his Polish. He would work on learning, uh, learning uh, Polish. Um, mm -hmm. Many rabbis, the community, community rabbis, they dedicated the night to have meetings about community needs. Just in a very technical sense. There's all types of needs that need to be done for the community. All types of committees and budgeting and uh, stuff like that. So we'll schedule a few of them for Nittal now, and this way we take care of the problem in a very subtle and simple way. Some of them play cards, which is already a little more interesting. Chess, we said, it's Chochma and everything. Here they actually, that's a Yaakov mentioned earlier, about paying, taking out the Kvitlach. So they play cards. They'll, they'll, they, they can, uh, he thought cards was only a Hanukkah thing, so here we have Hanukkah and Christmas together. We could very well be. It could very well be. I don't know. I, it's, a, it's a good <coughs> question that, that, that could I check into. Um, the Marsha, who is Hasidish? No, the Marsha did not learn a little nacht. Marsha was before. The, the Hasidim have tried to make him Hasidish late, lately. Why? Because he's in the Ukraine. And all the trips go to the all the Hasidic trips go to the Ukraine. So you have to make everyone there involved at some level. So there's been an attempt, but we he lived he lived before that. He was two hundred years before the Hasidus. He did not learn the Nacht. And what would he do? He would work on his budgets. He would work on it, do his accounting. He would go through his books, his numbers, he would work out his miser money. Um, which is interesting, and I'm not sure, but you could also speculate that it was the end of the the end of the, the Christian year. Now, I don't know if the fiscal year in the Middle Ages went with the, with the, with the Gregorian calendar, meaning, I don't know, it could be it went with the harvest, the harvest season, which is in November, which is more likely in an agrarian society. Today, the fiscal year ends with the, with the uh, regular Gregorian calendar, meaning in December, so it could make sense that you would work on your accounts and numbers during uh, Nittelnacht, and that would be a good way to... Uh, to, to do it. There, are, there were those who said that we can say Sipurei Tzadikim on Nittal Nacht. And now we get into trouble. Because Hasidus, which is where Nittal Nacht is commemorated, and main, mainly today, they attach great importance to Sipurei Tzadikim, the stories about Tzadikim. So much so that many of them have raised it to the level of actually learning Tyra. So they started an internal dispute Amongst different Hasidic groups, are you allowed to do Sipurei Tzadikim on Nittelnach? Because here you're saying this is not learning Torah. If you do it, you say, I'm doing it on Nittelnach because it's not learning Torah. But on that same topic of, of, of Sipurei Tzadikim, there were those who used that, that time to read outside literature. Science, geography, um, uh, um, chemistry, uh, you know, anything about nature, about the natural world, and history. 
So that means the history is also not learning Tyra, unfortunately. You know, I would, I would maybe dispute that also. But there were those who decided to devote the night to reading history. So there we go. We're doing a great thing now. We're, uh, we're par taking part in that also. So at the end of the day, most, uh, most people, in yeshivas, by the way, Nechsam Seifer wrote about this, and others wrote about this, is famous from Nechsam Seifer, but it happens to be that other people wrote about it also, that people who are regularly learning Torah in a yeshiva, what they should do is they should go to sleep. I think in Sanz they do it till today. I'm finishing up now. Um, and, I don't know. I don't know. It's a good question. Because it's is yeshiva, but they had a very strict curriculum. So it could, uh, I would want to find out about that. It's a good question. I'm very curious. I, I would say that they probably uh, did not learn it till now, because to make a revolution like that would be too much, even though he did a lot of revolutionary things. But, um, but I, I'm not sure. I, I can't say. I would want to look into it. And so uh, in the, I think in Sanz, I think in other places, the minute is to go to sleep after Shkia, and then to wake up at Chatzais and to make up for lost time. What they did the next night is up to anyone's guess, because once they're... I see what my kids are like after two days in America. The, the, their internal clock is off, so um, uh, so I can imagine what the yeshivas must have been. Kind of a little wrinkle in that. You have to stay up to the amount of lighting, and it's ah uh, yeah, yeah, but if they can see them, if they're chisla chasidim, they could light at two, three in the morning. So let me wake up. <laughs> so so that could be also. Now we see today that chasidim are the only ones who kept it. So why do most of us not and keep the yekis? Yekis, and the yekis. Yeah, totally kept it. Rebroyer kept it? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Didn't know that. Um, so the Rebroyer, the Yekis keep it too? That's interesting. So, so most of them don't keep it. Um, there's always que kinds of questions if you do it on Shabbos or not, and many said you don't do it on Shabbos. And the, following a similar line of thought, many said that in Eretz Yisrael you don't have to keep Little Nacht because... Uh, I don't want to say anything, but it's not really in Golos, and Eretz Yisrael is different, and it's not the exile, the Kedush of Eretz Yisrael, there's no Klippus in Eretz Yisrael, and therefore in Eretz Yisrael it's not done. Now in the Muslim lands, where it wasn't Christian, no Christian lands, in Iraq, Rabbi Vadya, he writes a whole chuba about it, we never did it, we never heard of it, we don't have anything to do with it, it's not bothering us little now. It has to do with being under the direct influence of the church, which is something we're speaking about all along, that it's a historical meaning. It's something that reflects the circumstances of the time. People who lived in Islamic places, you say all the Torah you want about why you should, that, that the fact that Jesus came down, and it's a big problem, and that's why we're not allowed to learn. But at the end of the day, I don't see it. I don't see the church in front of me. I don't see this, the holiday being celebrated because I live in Morocco. Then therefore, it's not kept. And it was never kept in Jews of the Islamic lands, in those communities. So, here you have an interesting situation. You're moving up to modern times. Sephardim aren't keeping it. Jews in Eretz Yisrael aren't keeping it. And there's less and less fear from the surrounding Christian population. And if you combine all that together, then it simply falls away. The Vilna Gain was, uh, was quite against uh, keeping it for other reasons. The Chazinish said that there's no fear from the Christians anymore. So uh, we won't, uh, we won't, we don't have to do nitl We don't have to not learn a nitl nach. Meaning that's a straight up reason he's taking on that that stream of, uh, of of thought that I mentioned earlier. That it's a technical thing. Once the technicality is removed, there's no reason to keep it. His brother-in-law, the stipler, who came from a chassidish of home and family and kept some stuff, so he said he's not learning nitl nach from a safer. But he didn't say it's because of him. He said he doesn't want to offend the Hasidim. He doesn't want to offend them. So he would learn by heart on the Tilnach. He only learned by heart. Uh, that's what he did. Um, so then came along, and this is the last, uh, the last stage, is that we have all these reasons not to do it. Eretz Yisrael, we have no fear of the Christians anymore, Jews who come from Muslim lands, and Eretz Tzvi Hudekuk wraps it all together and says, today we have a Jewish state. If we have a Jewish state, then there's no reason to do things because of the Christians. We don't do things, not because there's no fear, but the very fact that there is a Jewish state, then there's no reason to do, start, to do things because of the Christians. That's a, a gullus, an exile mentality that we do things because of the Goyim, because of the surrounding Christian population. Now, we're our own people in our own land, with our own country, and we don't do things 
because of what others, uh, what others think and what others... Uh, so again, so if a person, you catch someone not learning on... I'm sorry, you catch someone learning on Nittel Nacht, <coughs> you could say that he's doing it because of the Gain, or because he's Sephardi, but you could say maybe he's a Shtikl Tzioni, and that's why he's really doing it. And maybe that's another reason to Dafka not to learn, that you shouldn't have someone <laughs> suspect you of that you might be Chas uh, V'Shalom uh, Tzioni. Um, so we'll, we'll stop it here. There's uh, a lot more to say about, both about Netanach and about how customs develop through historical circumstances. And um, should we do a, a few questions? Anyone have any questions? I have a quick question. Please. Is learning any other day of the year offense to do as well, or it's just a... <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> any other question? <laughs> so meaning what, um, to rephrase, what about Easter? Why did Easter have a Netanach? <coughs> so, you know, it's, 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 it's the significance of the day. Uh, Easter is the resurrection. What else Easter, 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 Easter arguably is the bigger one. Because that's, that's when you... That's the resurrection. That's the one in the Bible. Leil Shemur. Uh, it's Leil Shemur. Pesach. It's okay. I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, it's Leil Shemur. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I mean... Uh, Historically, Saturnalia was a more... Violent. It was a violent holiday that, I, that was adopted by... Right. I think I think I think it was violent in pagan times also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That's why they adopted a violent holiday that yeah. continued to be violent. Yeah, I think he was right. But uh but uh it had nothing to do with Christianity originally. There was violence against the Jews uh, simply because of whatever pagan holiday it was. Some some said it's not learned with practical reason, because that's why the question on mikvahs. If you learned it's practical, of course they close the mikvahs because they're afraid people would go out at night. There's also an issue of one of the things you're the question I'll be clearly did not learn like that. It was a it's also a minute of nothing. It's more than that. Like, you're right. I think I think you're so right because he held a mental. He he had his yeshiva go to sleep and only get up on chutzayis, and yet he still he still uh, he still said he still said to to open the mikvahs. Yeah, yeah. Clearly, clearly, I'm assuming all these lands that they said you can't learn the mikvahs also closed. They can say the men can go up, the men can go up, the women can go up. Yeah, it would probably be more of a risk. Uh, yeah. uh, he didn't mention Tashmash. There's an issue of Tashmash. That's what I said. Yeah, yeah but they, they, they didn't have to do no, not that was going out of the English. I know. In, I mean, it was the main thing. He was able, he was able, able to, to be born on that night. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything about it? That's just protecting the sunset. Yeah. Were there were there people who held two nickels? You said you mentioned in the beginning that there's no uh, yeah. yeah. people hold 365. <laughs> yeah. Some people are nervous about they might come to learn on it till now, so they don't learn the whole year. You know? No, but you said there are different calendars. So so the, the Julian calendar was the Julian calendar. Here's the here's how it goes. The Julian calendar was kept in the Russian Empire until the Revolution. As a result, any Hasidim who lived in the Russian lands, Chernobyl. Parts of Rizhin, Karlin, Chabad, all Skver was part of Chernobyl. So they would keep the Julian, which which comes out on, on January 6th or whatever it is. Out of Yom, the Russian Orthodox Church has, has Christmas in January. Oh, yeah, the Russian Orthodox Church never. After they changed, right. yeah. By the way, the British Empire didn't change to the Gregorian calendar until the 1700s. It wasn't only the primitive Russians. But there weren't that many Hasidic groups in uh, the British Empire. Just threw them out. <laughs> and, uh, so, so um, then the Gregorian calendar. So the question is: Is it a din in the day, December twenty fifth, or is it a din in that time? So when they switched the ten days because of the switch in the calendar from the Julian to Gregorian, do you keep the original day or do you keep uh, ten days later? And that was uh, machlekes amongst the Hasidim, and I think that some of them are machmir. I don't remember which ones, but. Uh, I will do both. Uh, make sure to be yitzah all the shittas. <laughs> okay, anything else? Not only about Nitzanach. There's something you're curious about from the... Any 